During the late 60s, two local funk bands in Tuskegee, Alabama decided to unite to perform at their college frat parties and talent shows. Within a short time, the guys Lionel, Mylon, Thomas, Walter, William, and Ronald would do so well that they would catch the eye of Motown founder Barry Gordy, who would sign them to his label, and the rest would be history. Within a few years, not only did they become the hottest act on the label, but they became the biggest funk band in the world. However, once one of them started to get most of the spotlight and most of the money, that bond that held them together immediately began to crumble. On this episode of Exposed, we look at the great rise and the tumultuous fall of one of the greatest funk bands of all time, the Commodores. The time was 1968. Two bands composed of students enrolled at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama decided to unite. The guys decided to call themselves the Commodores and eventually became popular performing at several talent shows and frat parties. They were eventually discovered by Benny Ashburn, a music insider, who was so impressed by their talent that he decided he wanted to manage them. He would arrange showcases for the band to perform, and rumors state that the group at times would even stay at his home. Eventually, Ashburn's investment paid off in spades. After several months, the group caught the attention of Motown founder Barry Gordy, who was looking for an opening act for his new group, the Jackson 5. He hired them right on the spot, and by the time the tour was over, he wondered why no other record label had signed the group, so he decided to give them one. From the get-go, the Commodores were self-contained. Traditionally, Motown ran by a system, which is often referred to inside the industry as an assembly line. They would have programmed songs and melodies and they would chronologically record the music and then have the artists come in later to sing on the track. However, what was different about the Commodores was that they produced and wrote their own music. Initially, it was difficult to get the Motown executives to agree to let them work independently. After the release and success of their first album, composed mostly of jazz and funk songs, they renegotiated their contract so that they could not only record and produce their own songs, but also get publishing rights, something Barry Gordy usually didn't offer his artists. For their second album, they decided instead of producing exclusively jazzy instrumental songs, they would focus more on being an R&B funk group. They had a system where Walter and Richie were co-lead singers. Their second and third albums became monumental, producing songs that would eventually become staples in funk music. Later they released pop hits like Easy and Too Hot to Trot, which made them well known nationwide. But once Lionel started writing and producing most of the slow jams for the band, their popularity went worldwide. Songs like Three Times a Lady, Oh No, and Sailing 
became instant classics. By the mid-70s, the Commodores were the biggest act on Motown's label. Lionel would eventually not only write the songs, but also sing lead on most of the band's hits. As the 70s were coming to an end, the Commodores became one of the most prominent bands in the world, selling out concert halls everywhere. This was good for the guys until the press and the audience started favoring Lionel in the media, and also his side projects started becoming his priority over performing with the band. Over time, issues came up over the attention and money. At times, reporters would arrange to do interviews with the band, but only speak to Lionel. In a newspaper article, a reporter wrote, Why is Lionel wasting his time with the Commodores when he could be a solo artist? Another situation that started to become an issue was Lionel's side projects. Eventually, Lionel's talent for writing and producing songs became well known to other prominent singers. Other artists such as Diana Ross and Kenny Rogers, America's top artists at the time, commissioned him to write and produce songs for them, which would take time away he would normally spend with the Commodores. While Lionel was away on these side projects, the group were stranded. Since Lionel by this time was seen as the lead singer, promoters wouldn't book tours and gigs for the band because they felt fans wouldn't buy tickets knowing that Lionel wouldn't be there. This inhibited the band from working and making money while he was away. This proved to be frustrating for the group and at some point the group decided to confront Lionel on if he wanted to do a solo album. He kept saying he'll be back. First he was coming back after working with Kenny Rogers. Then he had to do Diana Ross. Meanwhile we couldn't work. He wouldn't go on tour. And what promoter would book us without Richie? Not one of those days that he promised to come back did he show up. Finally, we had to go on without him. In 1982, Lionel made it official and left the Commodores to pursue a solo career. On Saturday Night Live, he made his official debut singing You Are The Sun, which became his first big hit. Lionel couldn't have had better timing in pursuing his solo career. Starting around this time, around 1982, technology started to change, so music started to change with it. VCRs were in 10% of homes all over the world, which caused artists to become more concerned about their image. Previously, fans were desperate to see their favorite artists once or twice on TV shows like American Bandstand and Soul Train. Now they could record videos of their favorite artists on TV, making it possible to see them whenever they wanted to. Record companies started capitalizing on this by investing heavily into music videos to promote their artists. Unfortunately, every time music experiences these changes, those who don't evolve with it get left in the dust. Lionel was giving good advisement and direction when it came to adjusting to the change. For his next album, which featured songs like All Night Long, he came off as a totally different person. Previous to this, he sported thick eyeglasses and afro and conservative clothing. Up until the early 80s, if you were in a funk band, the style was to either dress like a space cadet or dress like a pirate. That practice went out the door. Now all of a sudden Lionel had fashion. He ditched the glasses, started wearing bright colors, and suddenly he had good hair. Also, he developed a swag. 
His bandmate Thomas said before Lionel was shy. Now he was singing and dancing in music videos like he was Michael Jackson. This change proved to be a godsend for Lionel. By the time he finished promoting his second album, he became the biggest artist on the Motown label. After Lionel went solo, the Commodores really struggled to stay afloat, but bad events constantly cursed them. It started with their management. When Lionel left, he took their music arranger with them, and they also lost access to his songs. Also, their manager, Benny Ashburn, who helped them get discovered, died from a sudden heart attack. According to Thomas, they started out behind when they spent so much time initially holding open auditions looking for someone who looked and sounded like Lionel. They ended up settling on a singer by the name of Skylar Jet. Unfortunately, the release of their first album, Post Lionel, turned out to be a disaster. Initially, the Commodores had conflict with the executives at Motown because they didn't think it was a good idea to release their album at the same time as Lionel's. One reason for this is probably because when labels market and promote projects, they focus most of their money for promotion on their bigger artists. The, the smaller artists suffer, and that's exactly what happened. When they released their next album, most radio stations refused to play it because they felt like the Commodores were trying too hard to sound like Lionel. The promotion was so bad that most of their dedicated fans didn't even know that they released an album. It's not really clear what happened, but by the time the Commodores started working on the next album, Skylar Jet was out as a member and they were seeking a new lead singer. When it was time to release the group's second album, Post Lionel, they decided to take a different approach. When the Commodores were on Soul Train in years previous, they met another funk band by the name of Heat Wave. Heat Wave had had it big with major songs such as Always and Forever, Boogie Nights, and Gangsters of the Groove. At some point, the two groups even hung out together and eventually the Commodores hired them to open up while they were on tour. After the tour, Heatwave's lead singer, John Wilder, got into a major car accident that left him paralyzed and he was replaced by singer J.D. Nichols. If you watch the video Gangsters of the Groove, you can see him singing co-lead with Johnny's brother, Keith. When the Commodores started working on their next album, they contacted J.D. and asked him if he wanted to join the group, which he gladly accepted. The album somewhat put the group back on the map with the release of their song Night Shift. The song dedicated to the memory of Jackie Wilson and Marvin Gaye did moderately well on the charts. After this hit, it seemed like the group was on their way back to being on top again. However, little did they know that trouble was lurking around the corner again. Around that time, the late 80s, apartheid started to become a major political issue. those of you who don't know, apartheid was a civil rights issue going on in South Africa where the residents and narratives were experiencing racial issues similar to the civil rights issues in America. However, in South Africa, the brutality was ten times worse. Victims would experience things such as genocide, body amputation, and murder. To call it an issue of just discrimination and racism would be putting it lightly. Music artists worldwide decided to get involved and developed a treaty stating that they would no longer perform in Sun City, the capital of apartheid, until the practice was abolished. Some artists who ignored the treaty and performed there anyway were criticized by their home country. The Commodores will be one of them. Towards the end of the 80s, the Commodores were approached and offered over $200,000 to perform in Sun City and they were planning on keeping it quiet. However, Marlon, one of the original members of the group, decided to express his disagreement with them performing there by going around to various radio stations and television shows exposing the group for what they were about to do. 
This caused major damage to the image of the Commodores. According to the guys, they had no idea that Marlon felt this way about performing in South Africa. The group got together, discussed the issue, and decided as a whole that they did not like the way Marlon had exposed him, and decided to take some action. We were all asked to go to South Africa. Marlon agreed to go to South Africa just like J.D. Nicholas, Walter Orange, and William King of the Commodores to do some good for the place. But when it got hot in the kitchen, as they may say, he left. They eventually sent him a letter stating that his actions were an act of betrayal and he was terminated from the group. The guys went on to perform in South Africa breaking the treaty. They were initially planning on donating a portion of their earnings to anti-apartheid groups. However, none of the groups would accept their donations. Marlon continued to expose the group for what they were doing on putting on TV shows such as Arsenio Hall. He would never perform with the group again. It would take years before the Commodores would overcome the damage this did to their image. However, just when they thought things couldn't get worse, more trouble was on the horizon. While performing on stage in South Africa, one of the members, William King, had a heart attack. After talking to the doctor, he was told there might be a pH issue with his blood. However, they would address that after dealing with his heart condition first. While dealing with the condition of his heart, the situation with the pH level in his blood grew worse, and that's where he learned he had cancer as well. He would have to go through surgery and 40 rounds of chemotherapy to deal with it. Fortunately, he would make a full recovery and went back to the group. By 1993, the Commodores left Motown and decided they would start their own record label. Lionel, in the meantime, continued to flourish like no other. By the time he released his second album, he became one of those prominent artists in the world. However, there seemed to be issues in his relationship to his wife. He had been married to his college sweetheart, Brenda. However, it was reported in the media that they were having problems. They went on a major television show to discuss their issues, and that's where it was reported that they had separated for some time, but decided to get back together to try to work things out. On one occasion, Lionel and his wife decided to go to a Prince concert, and while they were there, there was a child, Nicole, who was not being attended to, who happened to be the niece of music artist Sheila E. Her parents were experiencing financial hardship. They had difficulty caring for her, and Lionel offered to take her home and care for her over the summer. That summer became years. Eventually, Lionel and Brenda decided to adopt Nicole, and she eventually became a celebrity in her own right. This issue didn't really seem to deal or correct some of the issues in Lionel's marriage. Brenda started to suspect that Lionel was cheating on her and hired a detective to investigate who confirmed her suspicions that he actually was. On one occasion, he left his home and she decided to follow him to some apartment building. She managed to sneak into the building pretending to be a member of the building staff. When she arrived at the door, she found Lionel with another woman, Diane, naked and proceeded to assault both of them. Lionel managed to escape by getting his clothes on and leaving before the police and the press could arrive and take pictures. However, the story was reported to the press and was released nationwide. Lionel had met Diane while doing the closing ceremonies at the 84 Summer Olympics. They'd become close and she even appeared in one of his music videos. He managed to keep the relationship inconspicuous until this incident. After this, Lionel and Brenda divorced. Lionel and Diane went public about their relationship and eventually they got married. The two will go on to have two children together before divorcing a few years later. Sometime later, Lionel would make headlines over the divorce, which proved to be one of the greatest settlements in history. Reports state she received a settlement of $20 million, plus requested $300,000 a month in spousal support. 
Lionel has stated to the press with the cost of both of his divorces, he won't get married again. Over time, as the Commodores produced more records, more of the original members eventually left. However, there has been some conflict over the duration. Thomas left the group shortly after Lionel. When he took bookings advertising as a Commodores, he was threatened with litigation from the present members who trademarked the name. Several original members have drawn Lionel on stage for some of his concerts to perform some of their old hits. However, the members who are officially composed of the group now have refused a reunion. They have stated in several interviews that they don't appreciate the way that he left them high and dry, and that's too bad. I think if they did reunite, they would no doubt sell out crowds just like they did before.